During the Nintendo GameCube's retail lifespan, it was largely considered to be a flop. It sold a paltry 21.74 million systems. Compared to the Nintendo 64's 32.93 million total systems sold, the Super Nintendo's 49.1 million systems sold, or the NES's staggering 61.91 million systems sold. The GameCube wasn't quite the financial success that Nintendo had hoped for. Throw in some negative press reviews from the era, and it appeared the GameCube would be nothing more than a footnote in the history of gaming. So what's driving this renewed interest in the Nintendo GameCube in the modern era? Have they figured out that we were all terribly wrong about the GameCube during its retail run? Or are they just looking at it through rose-colored lenses and throwing cash at retro gaming nostalgia like happens far too often in the modern era? Come on, let's check out the GameCube together and find out why it feels so right today being so wrong back then. During the GameCube's retail life from 2001 through 2007, it was met with its share of less than glowing critical reception. At its 2001 launch, CNET noted that the GameCube lacked features that its competitors offered. And at its 2007 discontinuation, CNET said, Dead or alive, the GameCube is a bad deal. You see, by then, most people were playing multiplayer games like Halo Online, and the GameCube had no built-in internet support. And even if you supplied your GameCube with its optional internet adapter, there were very few games that could take advantage of it. This led online blog Joystick to note at the GameCube's launch that the lack of online games limits its market share. But I think the most powerful insult the poor GameCube endured during its launch had to come from Time International when it remarked that the GameCube was an unmitigated disaster. But fortunately for the gaming community, they were wrong. You see, the GameCube was never a bad game system to start with, and certainly not an unmitigated disaster. And let me just say this, if Time International played baseball, they would be the kings of the strikeout because they swing and miss a lot. Their assertion that the GameCube lacked innovation was utter nonsense. You see, the GameCube introduced a number of innovations for Nintendo, the first of which was to use optical disc media for the first time in a game system. The GameCube also introduced the use of memory cards for saving game data. Yet another innovation for the Nintendo GameCube was the ability to play your Game Boy Advance cartridges on the big screen. You could even link your Game Boy Advance to your GameCube to use it as a controller and a second screen. The GameCube controller was Nintendo's first to feature both dual analog sticks and rumble functionality built right in. But the most notable first for Nintendo has to be the introduction of the OEM wireless controller, the WaveBird. It features fast, reliable radio frequency, or RF, technology to connect it to the GameCube. And it adds only 5 milliseconds, or about one-third of one video frame, to the total gameplay experience. Take that, Time International! The hardware may be great, but content is king. Let's take a look at some of the absolute bangers on the platform. I want to take a moment to point out there are some common recurring themes throughout these games. See if you can spot them as we go through the list. First up, Animal Crossing. I think it's best described as a social simulator game with an endless, non-linear gameplay path. As the human player, you take up residence in a village filled with anthropomorphic animals. The goal of the game is to earn and save money so that you can pay off a house. You earn money by collecting natural materials and selling them. Along the way, you'll engage and interact with various life events in the game, including social interactions with the animals, attending events, and contributing to the village's development. Animal Crossing attracted a number of non-traditional gamers due to its unusual but immersive gameplay. Its focus is on family, friendship, and community rather than combat. It's one of the earliest examples of the casual gaming genre, and it continues to have sequels released for it even for today's modern Nintendo gaming platforms. But this is the game that started it all, and it holds a special place in the hearts of many GameCube gamers worldwide. Chibi Robo is a game developed by Bandai and Skip Limited. But when Nintendo Shigeru Miyamoto of Mario fame heard about this game's development, he lent his input to the project as well. As the player, you take on the role of Chibi Robo, a 10 centimeter tall robot owned by the Sanderson family. Among the game's goals is to navigate the household to locate happy points. You also progress through the game by helping solve family crises or locating lost items for the family. Every action you take in the game drains a little bit of your internal battery. Once in a while, just like with real-life devices, you'll have to stop in an electrical outlet, plug yourself in, and recharge your battery to full. The game is still loved to this day for its original premise and charming storyline. And it has a fun competitive element to it as well. Your goal is to become the top-ranked chibi robo in the world. It's like competing for the top spot on an online leaderboard before online leaderboards were a big thing. That's pretty cool. I think most gamers would guess that Super Mario Sunshine was the first Mario-themed title to be released for the GameCube, but it wasn't. Luigi's Mansion was, and it was a launch title for the system. It's the second Nintendo game in which Luigi is the main character, along with Mario is missing for the Super Nintendo. As Luigi, you've received notification that you won the grand prize of a mansion in a contest that you didn't enter. Jeez, they've literally had online scams since game consoles first started going on the internet. 
throughout the game you'll have to explore the mansion and try to find Mario who's missing. Yeah, again. You'll encounter ghosts throughout your journey and you'll need to capture them using a special vacuum cleaner tool called the Poltergeist 3000. There's even a tool called the Game Boy Horror, Nintendo's tongue-in-cheek reference to its own Game Boy Color. There are four total levels of the mansion to explore and each level has a boss battle at its end. The game's gameplay, atmosphere, and voice acting have all received both critical and gamer praise throughout the years. There are several sequels available to this game all the way up through the Nintendo Switch, but the franchise started right here on the Nintendo GameCube. The platform is host to one of the most unique variants of the Mario Kart series, Mario Kart Double Dash. It's the fourth entry in the Kart series and it has some elements that make their appearance for the first time here. Among them is the first appearance of Toad's sister, Toadette. But the innovative new gameplay element here is having two riders on one cart. The front rider drives while the rear rider uses items. Not only can you race with four local players on these Mario-themed tracks, you can also play the game through a local area network using the previously mentioned GameCube broadband adapter. There are four total gameplay modes to choose from, including Time Trial, Grand Prix, Versus, and Battle. The game has 20 total selectable characters, 11 of which are new to the series. Its arcade-style gameplay, high-quality graphics and sound, and new characters and items make Mario Kart Double Dash a must-have for any GameCube collector. The late 1990s and early 2000s were a transitional period for gaming from 2D platform-style games to games now using a new 3D first-person perspective. Among the games to master this transition is Metroid Prime on the GameCube. Metroid Prime is an action-adventure game, the fifth in the series, and it returned after an eight-year hiatus. Among the many things that makes Metroid Prime a standout title is that Nintendo says they put the emphasis on exploration rather than combat. For that reason, Nintendo classified the game as a first-person adventure rather than a first-person shooter. The game takes place between the original Metroid game and Metroid 2 The Return of Samus. You'll be battling space pirates and their biological weapons on the planet Talon 4. You'll also have to solve puzzles along the way to reveal some of the game's hidden secrets. Metroid Prime was the winner of a number of Game of the Year awards at launch. That should come as no surprise as seeing how, once again, Shigeru Miyamoto had his hand in its development. Not only is the gameplay top-notch, but the game's cinematics and soundtrack are unbelievable. Many gamers, even to this day, consider Metroid Prime to be one of the best video games ever made. You know, the great thing about consoles that don't connect to the internet is game developers have to get the game right the first time. And in the case of Pikmin, that's exactly what they did. Once again, that should be no surprise as Miyamoto was involved in the game's creation and development. Pikmin is a fun cross between a real-time strategy game and a puzzle game. You take on the role of Captain Olimar, whose spaceship has crash-landed on the planet PNF-404. The local Pikmin are intelligent, loyal plant-like creatures, and they join forces with you and follow your orders to help you try to reclaim the 30 pieces of your broken spaceship. Throughout your journey, you'll also have to deal with the fauna, inhabitants of the planet that are harmful to both the player and Pikmin. You'll have to collect at least 25 parts of your spaceship to win the game, and there are three total endings depending upon the total number of parts you collect along the way. Gameplay is split into individual days, and you have 13 total minutes in each day to achieve as much as you possibly can. There's no way to be a solo ranger if you want to win at Pikmin. You'll have to befriend and cooperate with the planet's inhabitants in order to be successful. There are a number of sequels to this game, but just like several other titles mentioned in this video, Pikmin got its start on the GameCube. When a new game system is launched, sometimes their launch titles aren't very good. That is absolutely not the case with the GameCube, as Star Wars Rogue Leader Rogue Squadron 2 is an absolute gem. In this game created by LucasArts and Factor 5, you play either Luke Skywalker or Wedge Antilles. The game spans the storyline of all three original trilogy Star Wars movies. You know, the ones that didn't suck. You'll be doing battle against the evil Galactic Empire across 10 total missions in a variety of worlds. Oh, and if you're into Star Wars eye candy, this game absolutely delivers. The game's presentation always gives you the feel that you're inside the Star Wars universe. It's almost hard to believe that a game that looks this good and plays this well was a launch title for the GameCube. While the game has replacement voiceovers, it has the original John Williams soundtrack from the three films. You can choose from a selection of six total ships, the A-Wing, B-Wing, X-Wing, Y-Wing, T-16, and the ship that made the castle run in less than 12 parsecs. If you ever wanted to know what it was like to shoot down TIE Fighters from one of the two gunner's chairs, this is it. Of the 650 plus North American games released for the GameCube, Super Mario Sunshine is my absolute favorite. While trying to vacation on the beautiful Isle Delfina with Mario and his friends, Princess Peach is kidnapped by the evil Shadow Mario. And per usual, it's up to Mario to save the day. Teamed up with Flood, the rechargeable water-based backpack, Mario encounters new allies and foes like Bowser Jr., Toadsworth, 
Petey Piranha, Shadow Mario, Gooper Blooper, Piantas, and Nokis. You can use the Flood Backpack to hover or fly through the air at high speeds, spray enemies or goop, or even dash at high speeds on the ground. The Delfino Emergency Broadcast System keeps you informed throughout the game, and there are many secrets to be discovered throughout your journey. Do you have what it takes to collect all 120 Shy Sprites, rescue Princess Peach, and restore peace and freedom to Isle Delfino? Okay, fess up. You knew this game was coming. You just didn't know when. There's absolutely no way we could have a conversation about the GameCube in the modern era without including Super Smash Bros. Melee. It was released in 2001 as one of the early games for the GameCube, and it's the second game in the series. The fighter roster for the game includes characters from such Nintendo IPs as Mario, Pokemon, The Legend of Zelda, and Star Fox. Compared to traditional fighting games, the game has a rather unorthodox style of measuring damage. The counter increases a percentage rather than decreasing a health bar. This counter measures the amount of knockback power the player will receive. To win the bout, your goal is to knock the player off of the stage. Super Smash Bros. Melee features beautifully rendered 3D backgrounds themed around Nintendo's IPs. The game was the number one selling best game on the GameCube platform, and for good reason. Four players can compete head-to-head -head simultaneously in a variety of different modes. Melee offers a near-perfect balance of graphical quality, orchestral soundtrack, and tight gameplay and controls. And even to this day, over 20 years later, Melee is played competitively in gaming tournaments around the world. It's a testament to the game's enduring playability and one of the main reasons people seek out the GameCube system today. But the GameCube's no one-trick pony and The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is proof positive. As the player, you take control of Link with the goal of saving your sister from the evil Ganon. There are a number of things about this game that differ from its predecessors. First of all, it uses a cel-shaded graphics style rather than the traditional 3D animated polygons. The game is set at sea and takes place across a series of islands. It's wind that helps a sailboat go forward, and you can control the wind using a magic wand known as, wait for it, the Wind Waker. You'll also have to explore and fight your way through a series of dungeons in order to gather the power necessary to beat Ganon. The game's beautiful graphics, orchestral soundtrack, and engrossing gameplay make The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker a must-have for GameCube fans everywhere. So what is it that's got gamers clamoring to get their hands on a GameCube? Is it a matter of personal greed and just wanting to add more pieces to their shelf collections? I don't think so. When you look back through some of the games featured in the video, you'll see that they have common threads, like community, friendship, teamwork, problem solving, and appreciation for the value of family. In my opinion, these things are sorely lacking from games in the modern era, and I think gamers yearn to have these things reintroduced into their gaming experiences. Nintendo knew the importance of these qualities when they launched the GameCube over 20 years ago, and the stories and the joy they bring to gamers around the world are more than just a snapshot in time. They are timeless. Here's another game system that's had a resurgence of late, the Atari Jaguar. Check out the video shown on screen and link to the video description and pinned comment to find out why.